Hello, my name is Scott Schrader. I am the current president and program coordinator for the Monroe County Civil War Roundtable in Bloomington, Indiana. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Tonight's speaker is none, none other than our Roundtable's very own newsletter editor and incoming president, Steve Rolfe. Steve is one of the founders of our Roundtable and is a longtime Civil War enthusiast. Steve's talk tonight will be or excuse me, resurrecting our Legacy Program series. Legacy Series programs were centered on one of our members' ancestors who played a role in the Civil War. And we are always interested in hearing more such stories from our members. Steve's program tonight will focus on his great-grandfather and the unit with which he served, the 8th Virginia Cavalry. Please join me in congratulating Steve on being the incoming Roundtable President and welcoming him as a speaker. Steve, welcome. Finally, after a little technical snafu. Okay, thank you. I was desperately, I have two other laptops in the house, and I was trying to get one of them hooked up, and then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I don't have my program on that laptop, so <laughs> I couldn't use it. Um, but I think, I think I am there. Okay, you can go ahead and share your screen, um, and then we can get to the PowerPoint presentation. I can get back set up. Why didn't that work? Is it there? Yep, we can see oh. it. Okay, good. Good. And go up to the top line and there's yeah. slideshow will be there. There you right. go. Oh, I've done this enough time. Ah, come on. Hey, looky there. It's a miracle, folks. It's a miracle. Okay. Are you ready for me to launch? <laughs> Go right on. Head right into it. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, folks. That was just a little wonderful. It's interesting because just to, to say, and I won't take too much time, I actually had set up for some automatic updates to be done last night at 10 o'clock uh when i was uh, in bed or almost in bed and evidently it didn't happen and they just decided to do it about 20 minutes ago so i don't know what happened there but uh anyhow okay i think i'm ready to go uh pardon me if i seem a little frazzled that was just so much fun anyhow thank you scott uh thank you to everyone who has joined me finally to hear this little story that I have to tell about my personal connection to the Civil War. Although it won't be quite as personal as I originally hoped it would be, because after a few months into my re research, I realized that number one, I was not a genealogist <laughs> and uh, that things had been a little bit more difficult to find than I had hoped. But it also will be, I hope, a, a good, um, war story, civil war story in general about the war in the Northwest corner of what was then the Confederacy, an area of the war that I think most people know less about than the big battles in the individuals or the Eastern or the, the larger Western theater. Um, okay, so my, and let me calm down here a minute. This has been a, a really thing. My agenda tonight will be first to tell you a little bit about my great, great grandfather whose name was Graham Grimes Wilson and was indeed a Civil War veteran. But then I'll use that to launch into the role of his cavalry unit in the war, which as you can see on your screen, is the 8th Virginia Cavalry. Uh, at the end, I have a couple of really personal anecdotes that are not directly connected necessarily to the Civil War, one of them not at all, but they were interesting things that turned up in my research and I thought I would share them with you. They won't take long. Um, let's see if I can stick to that program. If you're like me, when people find out that you're a Civil War buff, nut, student, whatever you want to say, one question that eventually always comes up is, oh, do you have any relatives who were in the Civil War? And my answer to that has always been until a few months ago, well, I don't know. I, I'm not interested in that kind of thing, the personal history. I'm interested in the war itself, the history of the war, the people in the war, and not my connection to it. 
Um, excuse me for that. I was moving things around there. Um, I, as I said before, I'm definitely not a genealogist, but my older brother, a few months ago, well, more than a few months ago now, a few years ago, a couple, three years ago, was doing a little genealogy research for himself. And he found out that, guess what? I did have a relative who was a uh, soldier in the Civil War. And so I took that and ran with it. Uh, I just assumed at the time he would be a Union veteran because I'm a Yankee. Uh, the, the people that I know in my family that have been this way are from Eastern Kentucky and from Pennsylvania. And most of them would be Northern oriented, I think. Um, and I, 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 I took that and said, okay, who is this guy? To my high surprise, I found out that my great great grandfather, Graham Wilson, was a member of the 8th Virginia Cavalry. He was, as they say, a dang rebel. And I decided that demanded a little investigation. Um, I started that investigation a couple of years ago when my wife and I were driving back from visiting some family on the East Coast and we were tired and it was late in the day and we decided to stop in Huntington, West Virginia to spend the night. Uh, just pulled off the interstate, found a hotel and, and got in there. And we knew that the next day we didn't have that long a drive to get back. So bless her heart, my wife even said, you know what we ought to do is go down and see, and I'll tell you more about where this is in a minute. We ought to go down and see if we can find your great great grandfather's grave. She was fully aware of what was going on there. And one of the only things that I knew at that time was that Graham Wilson was born, or excuse me, was buried in Pine Hill Cemetery in Louisa, Kentucky. And Louisa is only a few miles, about 30 miles south of Huntington. Um, and so I said, okay, we'll give that a try. So the next morning, with a relatively short drive home, we decided to take the time to do this. It was about a 30 mile one way detour. Uh, I made a few phone calls. If you've ever done this kind of thing, if you've ever gone to an old cemetery, uh, you should not probably do that and wander around and try to find a grave. It's almost impossible. But I, I decided to call, excuse me. Um, actually, the first call I made was to a funeral home in Louisa, figuring, well, they ought to know where people are buried. Well, even the fellow there did not know, but he says, I know someone that can help you. And I swear there must be one person like this in every town. He said, let me give her a call. And she called me and introduced herself. And she says, what did you need? And I told her what I wanted. And she said, oh, okay. Graham Wilson, 8th Virginia Cavalry, Pine Hill. I said, she said, give me about 30 minutes to look at my files. And and call me back. So in about a half an hour, I called her back and sure enough, she had nailed it. And uh, I was on my way to Pine Hill Cemetery, which as she described the location was on a little windy road on a hill up above the Burger King in Louisa, Kentucky. And that's an accurate description of it. Uh, <laughs> there is, uh, as I said, there's somebody like this in every town and I cannot help but thank her enough. Um, about an hour after leaving the hotel in Huntington, we found ourselves climbing this little winding road. And within about 15 minutes, I was standing at the foot of my great great grandfather's grave. It was that easy. And here it is. Uh, and as you can tell, it's a Confederate, uh, government supplied Confederate stone, Graham Wilson Company K, 8th Virginia Cavalry. Uh, that was obviously uh, his birth and death dates. Uh, I s took a few minutes to pause and reflect on this and, you know, just take a moment. And then I thought, well, OK, that's about all I can do for now. And we got in the car and we finished going home. I filed it away mentally uh, saying, OK, I'm going to see what I can do with this later on. And actually, the next thing that happened that caused this tonight was that the gentleman that introduced me tonight, uh, Scott Schrader came back from a Civil War journey he had been on and he had found something he thought I might be interested in. 
blah, blah. The 8th Virginia Cavalry Regimental History, uh, which I didn't at that time even know existed. I hadn't researched that yet. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the state of Virginia commissioned a regimental history to be written about every unit in the, every Virginia unit in the Civil War. And uh, this was one, it was written by a man, as you can see on the cover, his name was Jack Dickinson. Uh, and I was sort of thrilled about this because if you've got other regimental histories, for instance, I have the regimental history of the 27th Indiana Infantry, which I treasure, but it was written by Edmund Brown in the 1890s, and he was a member of the unit, and he obviously had a lot of uh, things to think about, and he had 30 years to forget things and 30 years to add things. I like this because this was uh, a book that was written by a historian in the 1980s or 1990s rather than a veteran 30 years after the war. So a historian would do proper research and give me I think good information. It's been a valuable thing. Thank you, Scott. I will I will treasure this forever. Um, okay, let me take a minute here. I'm still calming down. Um, so, Thomas Graham Grimes Wilson was born in Wayne County, Virginia, and I'm going to show you. This is Virginia, and you need to remember, this is Virginia in 1860. And you can easily see that it looks like Virginia and West Virginia. West Virginia did not become a state until 1863. So this was Virginia in 1860. Um, this next slide is a line drawing actually out of the book and it's about a map don't worry about the the movements in the units I just, it was a very nice line drawing of what became west virginia and it's much easier to find things on and i can tell you here real quickly this is louisa kentucky well, i was i was staying in huntington west virginia which is right up here this is louisa kentucky just to give you a, a, a heads up on things this is the dividing line between kentucky and at that time, the state of Virginia, it's the big Sandy River, which empties into the Ohio River right about here. If you can follow my little arrow, and of course, the Ohio goes over here and, and back to Pittsburgh. Um, or I should say that's where it comes from, not back to Pittsburgh. But so um, this was what would become the state of West Virginia in 1863. My, let me look here. I've got a thing. Da, 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 da. Okay, so my great great grandfather was born in Wayne County, Virginia at the time, which is right here. Uh, the 8th Virginia Cavalry was formed in Cabell County. I thought it was Cable, but I've heard people pronounce it C A B E L L. It's Cabell County, West Virginia, which is right here, which is where Huntington is now. Um, and uh, at if you didn't know any better, people might say, wow, a guy from Virginia, how did he get hooked up with a lady from Kentucky? Well, basically, all he had to do was walk across the, the bridge, uh, because as I say, he was born here and his wife was born in Louisa, Kentucky, which is right at the tip of this little red arrow. Um, so it wasn't all that big a deal. Um, the. Hang on a second here. All right. So uh, my great great grandfather, as I say, was born in Wayne County. He grew up there. He somehow met this young lady from Louisa, Kentucky. He married her. They ended up having 11 children. Uh, those were the good old days. And um, he went off to war in 18, actually he didn't join until 1862. We'll get to that more in a minute. But he went off to war in 1862 def to defend his state, uh, which was Virginia, of course, at that time. And then he came back from the war. He lived his life out, and I don't know much about it. In actually in Louisa, Kentucky, he was in the 1870, 1870 census, a um, resident of Lawrence County, Louisa, Kentucky. 
uh, and he was walking along the streets of Louisa in 1897 on New Year's Day, and he suddenly had a heart attack and died on the street. So that that's about as much as I know about my grandfather's story. But it gets me to talking about his uh, his service in the Civil War. Um, I have found no letters, diaries, or any accounts of friends to give me any more personal information, but I can tell you a little bit about the 8th Virginia Cavalry. And what I'm going to do here is just really run through very quickly because this can be an extremely confusing, and we're talking about four years of service. I'm not going to bore you with, I hope, a whole lot of stuff. Um, but I would like to tell you about the cavalry because as a, a historian that I talked to in um, Kentucky a few months ago, a man by the name of John Preston, he's an attorney historian. Seems It's amazing how many attorneys end up being historians in the end, too. He told me, he said, well, it's not surprising. He said, 98% of the people that I have tried to study, I can't find anything on. He says, it's, it's, but you can find stuff about their unit. So that's what ended up happening. Um, the original uh, group, it was actually a, formed as a militia group in late 1860. Uh, it was not the 8th Virginia Cavalry then because there wasn't a Confederate army then. Um, but it was called, uh, variously called, they had a lot of names, the Border Rangers, the Fairview Rifles, or the Big Sandy Rangers. But it was a militia group that uh, trained on the weekends and was there to, as they said, to defend the flag of Virginia. And I think no one had seceded yet. They weren't really sure what was going to happen. So that's pretty much where it sat for a while. Um, in the end, this unit has been referred to as one of the, quote, fightingest units in the Confederate Army. By mid-1862, it numbered over 800 men and 11 companies. Get my statistics right here. By the end of the war, over 1,800 men had enlisted and served in the unit. It had carried the Confederate flag through seven states, including Kentucky, Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, and as I say, while often they were referred to as the equivalent of a home guard, um, more than regular troopers, which was probably true early in the war, especially, uh, in the end, they epitomized what we saw as the brave spirit of Virginians, another quote from another member of the group. But in 1861, these guys were raw recruits. They were, they were troopers that didn't have a lot of training. And most of what happened in their first year was in the form of raids, skirmishes, uh, that kind of thing. They were not organized until uh, later in 1861. In fact, November of 1861 is when they actually got into the Confederate Army and, and were starting to be called as the 8th Virginia Cavalry. Um, but uh, they had a lot of interactions with troops, federal troops from across the Ohio River in Ohio. And it's, it's, it's interesting what happened. Um, they, as an example, and this is one of the early things in the war, the, the 8th Virginia at that time uh, went and, quote, captured uh, some Yankees, or they went looking for, excuse me, some Yankees who were reported to be in a town on the other side of the Ohio River. They crossed the river. There were no Yankees there, but there were some citizens with firearms, and they captured the citizens, took away their weapons, and told them to, quote, behave or they could get hurt, which I thought was interesting. And then when the federal troops on the other side of the river that weren't that far away heard about this, they crossed the river to the Virginia side, and they did the same thing with another community. And in the end, everybody went home happy. So that's the way that things went for several months. Um, but in studying the 8th Virginia Cavalry overall, I have determined that um, West Virginia ended up sending almost 40,000 men off to serve in the war. Uh, there are West Virginia graves at Antietam. And again, that was several months before West Virginia became a state. Uh, and those, those 40,000 men are almost evenly split, split between the um, Confederate and the Union armies. Uh, about 20,000 on each side served in the war. 
And I've also, in looking at the 8th Virginia, have determined that they were sort of the Forrest Gump of the Civil War and that they seemed to pop up in places you wouldn't expect them to during the entire uh, length of the war. And I'll, I'll get to some of those in a minute, but um, they were, well, let's start with 1861. Uh, there were a couple of engagements in 1861 that the uh, that are significant in this. The first one actually didn't involve the eighth, but I wanted to throw it in, and that's the Battle of Philippi, which was on June 3rd, 1861. This has an interesting tie for us here in the end. Um, the Battle of Philippi was uh, the first significant organized land battle of the Civil War. Um, and I can tell you where Philippi is. If you see the little blue star, this is Philippi right here. And it was a rail crossing, um, a rail junction uh, about midway between the Northern States and the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And Major General, you'll recognize this name and a lot of other names I come to, Major General George McClellan was then the commander of the Department of the Ohio. And he ordered about 3,000 troops to go to this crossroads and protect rail lines of the B&O Railroad. Um, the green Confederate troops there basically caved pretty quickly. And in fact, some people ended up calling this the, the races at Philippi because they raced so fast to get away from McClellan and his men. It wasn't really a huge victory. It wasn't a big deal. But there were a few interesting results of it. One of them was that George McClellan gained national prominence. And of course, Lincoln was looking for a new general. Here was a guy who had had a victory in the West, uh, who was very popular with his troops. And eventually this led to McClellan being named the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, another thing that Philippi caused was to bolster the, the resolve, I guess you would say, of what was called the Wheeling Convention. And this was a group of people who were trying to get West Virginia established. They were trying to get this section of the state of Virginia to break off from the other because this part of Virginia was mountainous. It was not uh, at all prone to slave labor. Uh, and these people had to make a determination whether they wanted to stay with the, the individual hard scrapple farmer or whether they wanted to go with the heritage of the slave plantations of the East. And in the end, uh, they obviously decided to go uh, to their own way and, and split off from the state of Virginia. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the third thing, and one that's interesting for our round table that happened here was Philippi was the first battle of the Civil War that had an amputation. And you may be able to know where I'm going here. One of the people that was had a limb amputated in that battle was James Hanger. We had a program a few months ago about James Hanger. James Hanger had his leg amputated. He went home. He actually worked very hard at creating his own artificial limb that was articulated. He used uh, barrel staves and leather straps and everything because he wanted to be able to walk again. And he went on later to patent that leg and to patent the process and the hanger or the Pedics company is still in business today and is, if not the largest, one of the largest orthopedic suppliers in the world. Uh, and that happened at the Battle of Philippi in 1861. Uh, it started there because he was wounded and had to have his leg amputated. But the first battle that did involve the 8th Virginia Cavalry was the Battle of Carnifex Ferry. And that happened on September the 10th of 1861. Uh, Carnifex Ferry was a crossing of the Gauley River. And again, we can go back to our map and you can see this is, this is where Carnifex Ferry is. And the river isn't on here, but the river comes down and does a wide turn here and goes this way. Um, and there is a crossing there. In fact, I can show you, this is a, uh, that the, American Battlefield Trust has this on the website, but I thought it was interesting. This is actually a woodcut of John Floyd's Confederate troops crossing at Carnifex Ferry. And the reason this was an important crossing because it was about the only place you could cross. If you look at this, let me enlarge it a little here. Um, 
if you look at this, this is a mountain back here. There's another mountain off to the right. There are mountains behind us. So this is the only place to cross the river. Um, and it was a very important point. And at that time, the Confederates were holding it, but Union Brigadier General, another name you'll recognize, William Rosecrans, now having replaced McClellan, uh, came with about, and I've got a number here someplace. Eh, I thought I did anyhow. Anyhow, he came with a large, oh, there, there it is, about 7,000 men to advance against John Floyd's troops. Now, you may remember John Floyd also because John Floyd was the Secretary of War from 1857 to 1860 under Buchanan. And Floyd was accused, and I think probably rightly so, during his tenure, he was a Southerner, he was a Virginian, and he was accused of using his position as Secretary of War to stockpile arms and munitions in Southern, uh, geologically Southern um, forts, US forts, knowing that they would probably be turned over to the South if the South ever seceded. And that's exactly what happened. But anyhow, what happened was Rosecrans um, had a lot of the 7,000, but he did not send them in all at once or even a large contingent. He kept sending in waves of them. And John Floyd was able to, at Carnifex Ferry, to beat off each of these waves and actually held off the 7,000 men of the Union Army with about half that many Confederate troops. But that night he realized that the Union Army was bringing up artillery and he decided it was a pointless thing. So again, he left, uh, took his Confederate troops, including the 8th Virginia Cavalry, and they, they went uh, south toward Virginia. So this was the first taste of battle for the 8th Virginia and they did all right, even though it was a defeat. They didn't have many uh, casualties in this, but they did all right. Um, in 18, we get into 1862 now, and 1862 was another confusing and another active year for the 8th Virginia. Um, early on in the year, they were on picket duty in the northern part of the state, but Robert E. Lee was interested in, steering, in securing the Kanawha River Valley all the way from the Ohio River through Charleston, West Virginia, it would be, and into the breadbasket of Virginia, because that was the very thing. If you travel along Interstate 64 today, uh, if you've ever done this and driven through Charleston, West Virginia, if you're traveling towards the east, you will look off to your right and you'll see the Kanawha River before you with the beautiful West Virginia State Capitol on the other side of the river. And it was a major uh, means of being able to move troops uh, from the north to the south. And it was uh, valued by uh, both sides. They wanted to, to maintain it. So anyhow, the Confederates sent another name that you'll recognize, General Henry Heath, to Lewisburg, uh, which is near this area. Near the you know, Today, you may be familiar with the Greenbrier Hotel. Uh, I actually had car trouble in Lewisburg a few years ago. I wish I'd known all this was going on. I would have been able to get into it a little bit, except I didn't have a car, so it wouldn't have probably mattered. Um, he established a base there. And he sent the 8th Cavalry back toward the Ohio River to guard some Union prisoners who had been caught in a raid near the river. Um, but back to my great great grandfather for just a moment. This was actually about the time, this was in uh, 1862, uh, in August of 1862, and this was when he actually joined the cavalry. Now, I don't know why, I've not found any. Uh, papers to say why he joined, but I thought it was an interesting thing and I have a sort of a parallel story in my own life. I'm wondering if he didn't join until 1862 because this was about the time that the Confederacy instituted their first draft. And I thought, wait a minute, this guy already had, he was 33, 32 years old when the war started. He already had several children. He was gonna have a few more before everything was over with but maybe he didn't want to go off and leave his family unless he had to. And maybe the draft was what got him into the war. I do not know that, but I think it's a likely possibility because it's exactly what happened with my father. 
my father in 1941 was 21 years old. He already had two children. Well, actually he had one child and one on the way, but he already had a family going. And when the war started in 1941, he elected to not join up, but to wait until his country called him. And they did that eventually, not until 1944. He went in in May of 1944 and served for two years um, as a nose gunner and a uh, radio man on a B-24 Liberator bomber. Fortunately, he never went overseas or I might not be here today. Um, but uh, it's, it's that kind of thing that happens with people. They, they don't know what to do. And I know it was difficult for my father and it may have been difficult for my great, great grandfather to decide whether to join up and go off with his friends. Who knows? Uh, maybe someday I'll find out if I, if I dig a little deeper into this. Um, so now we're going to move on to 1863. And 1863 was probably the most significant year for at least the state of West Virginia, because that's when it became a state. It was in June of 1863. Um, much of East Tennessee and that area, of, I, I have friends that live in Knoxville, and it's the same kind of thing there. Knoxville was extremely pro-Northern uh, before the war and during the war. Uh, and actually, there's we'll bring up talk about Knoxville here again in a minute uh, in another uh, fashion. But the 8th Virginia Cavalry stayed in their winter quarters in 1863 through March. Then eventually they made their way south to the Shenandoah Valley in May. And this was the start of a march that would get them and they ended up at Gettysburg. Now I don't have any details on the 8th Virginia. They were in a rear guard reserve capacity. They did not have many casualties. They really weren't that involved, but they were at Gettysburg. After Gettysburg, the entire unit went back north into more familiar territory and back at White Sulphur Springs again. Again, this is near the, the Greenbrier Hotel, that area, very near Lewisburg. Um, there was a Confederate force under a General George S. Patton. Yes, the grandfather of the George Patton that we know uh, whose real name was George C. Scott. No, I'm just kidding, folks. Uh, but that is the same uh, family line. Uh, that was a long military line in that family. And he was ordered to uh, intercept, he was Confederate commander ordered to intercept a Union force in the area of Lewisburg. And he had just under 2,000 men. Make sure I got that number right. Yes, I did. 2,000 men, including several, but not all of the companies of the 8th Cavalry. So the Battle of White Sulphur Springs, this is Lewisburg, by the way, this is the location of Lewisburg right here. And the Battle of White Sulphur Springs happened on August 26th and 27th, mostly on the 27th of 1863. This road in the center was, uh, was a, a hotbed of action, um, but the eighth did very well in this engagement. Uh, the ensuing action over the next two days succeeded in protecting the Confederate force at Lewisburg, and the 8th was said to have, quote, inscribed their names high on the roll of those who in this war have illustrated the valor of our troops. It was in recognition of this action that the battle flag of the 8th Virginia Cavalry was inscribed, as you can see here, it's hard to read, but White Sulphur Springs, August 27th, 1863. Uh, Scott had asked me the question the other day. This is a, a cool artifact. I believe that this is in the West Virginia State Archives today. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I think that's where it's located now. Um, so by November of 1863, the 8th was ordered to move into Tennessee toward Knoxville. Now, now we're back to Knoxville again to support Confederate forces. Now, Knoxville was being held by Ambrose Burnside in the Union Army. Union Army, excuse me. Um, and on November 29th, uh, James Longstreet brought a force up to try to retake Knoxville. And what happened was a battle, it's called the Battle of Fort Sanders. And believe it or not, I did a presentation on the Battle of Fort Sanders with a little video. Oh, it's been several years ago now. Still have the video if you're interested in watching it. Uh, fort Sanders was a dirt fort that was built, and if you're at all familiar with Knoxville, it's where 
it's about where Thompson Bowling Arena is today. Thompson Bowling Arena is where Pat Summit won all of her national women's basketball championships over the years. And it's just a few blocks up the street next to the Tennessee River from um, Dillon Stadium, which is the sort of uh, uh, cathedral to un the University of Tennessee football today. At that time, it was just a bunch of dirt and they had a dirt fort there and the cavalry, or excuse me, the, uh, well, the cavalry and the soldiers had been given some very bad information in trying to attack the Union Fort at Fort Sanders to take it. They had been told it had a little small two or three foot wide ditch that they had to get across. Well, it turns out that ditch was eight to 10 feet wide and at least that deep. The soldiers in Fort Sanders, the Union soldiers in Fort Sanders were able to get over the top, shoot down on the um, people below. And actually it was a rather quick Union victory. Uh, and the um, Union forces, excuse me, the Confederate forces act, turned around and took off. Uh, and Fort Sanders uh, stayed in, in Union hands. Um, and also they found out that the, one of the reasons that they took off so quickly was that Sherman was headed to Knoxville with his army. Something that you'll hear more and more of as the war goes along, by the way, is the constant, the, the Union can follow up more easily than the Confederate troops because they have better supplies, more soldiers, that kind of thing. So then we get to 1864, during the early months of 1864, um, most of the time for the 8th Cavalry was, excuse me, most of the time the 8th Cavalry was spent guarding, skirmishing along the railroad route between Abingdon, Virginia and Chattanooga. But the action ended up spreading a little bit further east in the summer months. Jubal Early, with Lee's blessing, started a campaign to try to take Washington, D.C. And you might be able to see where this is headed if you know anything about Lou Wallace. Uh, but on July 9th of 1864, the uh, earliest troops met Union forces led by Lew Wallace at Monocacy, just outside of Frederick, Maryland. And it was an attempt to take. And actually, Wallace lost that day, but he was able to hold Early's troops off long enough that they would, uh, they were able to bring in reinforcements the next day, Union reinforcements. And so Lou Wallace has been considered to this day the, um, the savior of Washington, D.C., which is nice, too, because he sort of got shafted at Vicksburg by Grant because Grant said he was not. And we, again, we a tie back to Arthur. We had a, a program a long time ago by Gail Stevens. Um, Gail Stevens wrote the book Shadow of Shiloh, where she I think proved that Lew Wallace did not do what Grant accused him of doing, which is being dilatory and slow and not getting his troops there uh, to help Grant on uh, to, to take the victory at, at Vicksburg. Um, but anyway, the most interesting and perhaps the most controversial action that the 8th Cavalry participated in during the summer of 1864 was dur during Early's move back away from Monocacy towards the Shenandoah Valley. He arrived at Martinsburg, West Virginia, and he was told that federal troops under Brigadier General David Hunter had burned the homes of some prominent citizens in the Shenandoah Valley and had even put the torch to all of the buildings in VMI except the firmary. Oh, excuse me, there's the Battle of Fort Sanders. There, this is um, the VMI Cadet Hall after it was burned by Hunter's troops in 1864. Well, basically this infuriated Jubal Early uh, and he sent a subordinate to assess the situation. The subordinate's name was uh, John McCausland, General John McCausland. Hang on a second. I've got him here someplace. Yes. Here's General McCausland. He is a stern and severe. That's a heck of a mustache. Uh, stern and severe looking gentleman. And General McCausland was sent in to see what he could do about this. And he decided that 
uh, he was going to, and I've got a quote here, is it? Uh, he was going to open the eyes of the people of the North by an example in the way of retaliation. So on July 29th, 1864, after moving north, the, there were two brigades of Confederate troops, including the 8th Virginia, along with an artillery brigade. So the total force numbered about 3,000 men, and they moved into Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. They placed uh, the 8th Virginia in uh, defensive action in the hills west of town. And McCausland went in and he demanded from the city fathers, the mayor and the city fathers, a $100,000 in gold or $500,000 in script if he had it, but, it wanted, but really what he wanted was $100,000 in gold. And he called it a contribution uh, to keep their town from being burned. They refused to pay that. So McCausland ordered the city burned and burn it, they did. Uh, again, I just looked up some statistics. I was trying to find them and I found them today. In Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, they burned 500 structures. They left 2000 people homeless. One resident did die of smoke inhalation. Uh, damage estimate was in 1864 dollars, about $1.6 million. Uh, and one diarist after the war said, we witnessed to the fullest extent the horrors of war. Now, the interesting thing is there were also some Confederate soldiers who sympathized with this and actually helped some of these people save their belongings and their homes. So it was not exactly the, the most, I, I think people thought that McCausland was just going beyond it. And that's the reason why today it still remains controversial. I, I'm pretty sure I can say this safely. I'm not a student of William Tecumseh Sherman, but I don't believe he ever just piecemeal burned a town in the march to the sea. Most of his actions were against military uh, facilities or anything that could support the um, Confederate army and its movements. Um, but I have to pause here for a minute and make a, what I would call a full disclosure admission about my great, great grandfather. Because in studying this, I discovered that my great, great grandfather was listed as, um, I need to keep my hand off that. My great, great grandfather was listed as having deserted his unit during early July of 1864, which means he would not have been at Chambersburg. But then interestingly enough, I dug a little deeper and found out that he was reinstated in the 1st of September of 1864 by presidential proclamation. So this was all really curious. I thought, well, here's a guy that deserted and then he came back. And I said, what's going on here? So I did a little research on desertions in the Civil War. And you don't need to read all this. I'll summarize it. Uh, I really did this more for myself than anything else. But there were really two basic kinds of desertions desertions in the Civil War. One was desertion in the face of the enemy. That was bad. That was cowardice. That's the one that got people severely punished, if not killed. And then there was simple desertion. Uh, there were all kinds of things that could make a soldier want to leave his unit. Sometimes it was because he had a buddy in the next unit and he would just go over and he'd spend time with his buddy in the next unit. Nobody knew where he was. Sometimes they had a crop in the field back home. Sometimes somebody back home had died and they couldn't get a furlough and they just left to go home. So desertion was not that big a deal. Plus the fact that as it says here, the average soldier, soldier spent 50 days in camp versus one day in battle or on campaign. So camp was boring conditions were really bad most of the time. And this encouraged these people to be surly and wanted to do things like desert because there was no reason to stay around. It wasn't very pleasant. Um, punishments varied from death by firing squad, which of course would be for cowardice, uh, to flogging, branding, hard labor, wearing a wooden sign around your neck or nothing. There were only about 400 soldiers on each side that were actually executed for desertion during the Civil War. Um, to the best of my knowledge, my great great grandfather, obviously, he lived. Uh, he went back to his unit and he served uh, admirably and to the end of the war. So 
Uh, I don't know why exactly he went because I have no personal recollections of it, but it evidently wasn't, certainly wasn't desertion in the face of the enemy that caused him to do that. Um, okay. I love these old pictures. This is a picture after the war of the uh, soldiers of the, and this is actually Company E, the Border Rangers, which was the original company. And then the uh, Company K, my great great grandfather, split off from this when this company got too large. Um, but I just love these old pictures and I just wanted to throw it in there because I think they're cool. Um, okay. Uh, that brings us to 1865, 1865, the 8th was uh, doing rear guard duty and that kind of thing. And then, then they were sent, they were actually reassigned to a different command and they were sent east again. And they actually ended up going to um, the area of Richmond and Petersburg and happened to get stationed on March 30th. I believe that's the correct date of 1865 at Five Forks outside Petersburg. Well, that was an unfortunate assignment because that was the last place that the Confederate cavalry caved uh, against Grant when uh, the siege ended and he started chasing uh, Lee back to, or up to Appomattox, I shouldn't say back, up to Appomattox. Um, who knows what happened there? Uh, everybody talks about George Pickett and Fitzhugh Lee and their shad bake, and everybody wonders why they didn't hear the um, the battle going on because they didn't. They didn't know it was happening. Um, it could have been an acoustic shadow. There are people who have proposed that today, but the bottom line is they were chased out, and that was uh, what led up to Appomattox on August, or excuse me, on uh, April 9th of 1865. And at that point, some members of the 8th Cavalry stopped in Appomattox with Lee's troops. Some of them went on to, that were left, went on to Lynchburg a few miles to the west with a couple of other cavalry units. Um, they accepted the terms in both places. They accepted the terms of surrender that were offered to Lee. And at that point, the soldiers of the 8th Virginia Cavalry disbanded and started the long march back to Wayne County and Cabell County, West Virginia to take up their lives again. And that pretty much covers those people's, those guys' uh, time in the war. The Next thing that I want to do, well, first of all, let me tell you, I'll give you some statistics here. In all during the nearly four years of service, the 8th Cavalry as a whole had 1,859 men enlisted in it, and they suffered the following losses, 52 killed in action, 77 wounded, almost 400 captured, 122 who died of other causes, obviously disease, um, and then of the 172 men that were in my great-great-grandfather's uh, unit, Company K, there were actually none of them were, that were killed in action. Not sure what that means. Uh, maybe they were just lucky. There were four people wounded in action, 52 were captured, seven died of other causes. So that's just a really thumbnail sketch of what the 8th Cavalry did and what my great-great-grandfather did. But now I want to Real quickly before we're done here, and I've, we've dragged this out along because of my technical glitch, and I'll try to get through this quickly. I have a couple of very quick sort of personal anecdotes that I want to get into here. Um, one of which has a connection to my great great grandfather and his final resting place, and one of them doesn't, but you'll, I think, see why uh, I was intrigued by it after doing my research. Okay, when I was driving up the little hill above the Burger King in Pine, or excuse me, in Louisa, Kentucky, to Pine Hill Cemetery, I drove by this area. This was on the other side of the main cemetery road. 
and it was fairly imposing. A couple of very large pieces of stone and a flag, and I didn't look at it too much because I was anxious to go see my great great grandfather's grave. But upon leaving, I stopped for a few minutes, and this here is not a headstone. This is a cenotaph, and it is a cenotaph in honor, and you can obviously see that in memory of Fred M. Benson, the 13th Chief Justice of the United States, and Fred Benson is buried there. This is his headstone and his footstone, uh, and I thought, wow, out here in the middle of nowhere is a Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. This guy must have really liked this area for some reason, I don't know. So I thought about that for a minute and I thought, wonder why. This is, by the way, is Frederick Moore Benson uh, when he was the Chief Justice. You can see his accomplishments there. I won't go to them in detail, you can read them. But I thought, well, wait a minute. And I went back and I looked at the company roster of the 8th Virginia Cavalry, which that's what this is. Let me enlarge that a little bit. And you can see right here, one of the commissioned officers was Samuel S. Vinson. And if you look over here, you've got four Vinsons. One of them I love too is Francis Marion Vinson. Um, four Vinsons who were in the unit. These were in my great-great-grandfather's company in the 8th Virginia Cavalry. So this was a man who clearly had a greater feeling and tie to his, uh, his home place, the place where he was born, the place where he grew up. And I always like to tell this story that uh, if you go to, many of you here have probably been to Arlington National Cemetery and everybody that goes there, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people that go there go to visit the Kennedy grave sites, a nice plaza beneath the Custis Lee mansion. And um, it's, it's beautiful. And I was there many years ago now, and I happened to be standing in the background and I was just watching other people visit. I was curious about how people would approach, how they would take the thing. And a guide, park ranger, excuse me for just a minute, came up to me and she said, how are you today, sir? And I said, oh, I'm fine. And she said, you, you're, you've been here a while. She says, are you interested in history? And I said, oh, yes. And she says, well, what you should do is turn around and step up in the grass behind or at the far end, I guess I should say, of the Kennedy Gravesite Plaza. She says, I think you'll find some interesting things. And she walked off. Well, of course, I did it. And You've heard of, of the Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. When I did that, this is what I discovered. And all of these are within a few feet of each other. Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Uh, you can see all the names. Uh, John Paul Stevens, William Rehnquist, and of course the most recent addition, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was not there when I was there originally, but her husband uh, that she loved so dearly had been buried there years before, and that's where she was was taken when she died. So I call this the Justice's Corner <laughs> at Arlington National Cemetery. And I thought, well, you know, my acquaintance, Mr. Vinson had the possibility of being buried within feet of Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. And he chose to go back to Louisa, Kentucky, a little town of about 2,500 people. And I just sort of think that's cool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, but I think it's cool that he wanted to go back and spend the rest of his eternal life uh, at a location uh, that was far, far away from the, uh, the matting crowd of Washington, D.C. and Arlington National Cemetery. Um, and then the other thing that I will quickly tell you about is, and I'll jump to the next slide. Okay, uh, most people don't know this, but by sort of technical right, my last name should not be Rolf. My last name should be Sembauer. And the reason I say that is because this is my father's birth certificate. And you can see he was born on, in May of 18, or <laughs> 18, um, May of 1920 at Lindsay James Sembauer. Um, and 
I didn't know this story until I was a teenager. But what happened was my father, well, his father, my grandfather, who his name was Shirley Smith Sembauer. He was a grocer from Connellsville, Pennsylvania, which is just southeast of Pittsburgh. It's, it's actually very near Falling Waters, if you're familiar with Falling Waters, the Frank Lloyd Wright house. Um, and he had come to, for some reason, to Ashland, Kentucky. He met my grandmother, Kitty Copley, and there are Copleys, by the way, buried in Pine Hill Cemetery. He came and met Kitty Copley. They got together. I'm not exactly sure how legal it was. They had my father. They produced my father. And something happened between them, and he left and went back to Pennsylvania when my father was a toddler. And what happened was that my grandmother remarried or married uh, a man named Stanley Rolfe, who I remember as a little boy. He didn't die until I was four years old. I can just barely remember Stanley Rolfe, but he has no blood connection to me at all. Okay, so where am I going with this? Well, <laughs> this, this was an interesting part of my research. Um, I discovered in doing research, genealogical research for the story of Graham Wilson, that, um, well, um, let me back up a little bit and say, people have asked me all the time when I tell them this story, they had asked me until a couple of years ago, oh, are you in a connection to Sembauer Field? If you're familiar with Indiana University baseball, until 2015, they played their baseball games at Sembauer Field, which is across V Lane from McNutt Quad here in Bloomington. And I always said, no, I don't think so. My Sembauers were from Pennsylvania. I can't imagine they'd have any connection here. Well, guess what? I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I found this out. If you go back one more generation, above my great-great-grandfather to my great-great-great-grandfathers, of which everyone of, every one of us has 16 great-great-great-grandfathers. Um, if you look at the lineage, one of them comes down to me, to my father, uh, and to me, but there's another line that comes down, the Sembauer line from Pennsylvania comes down to this man, this is Charles Jacob Simbauer. Charles Jacob Simbauer, I discovered, was from uh, originally from West Virginia. There we go again. Somehow his family had moved to Garrett, Indiana in the late 1800s. He grew up in Garrett, went to the high school there. I'm not sure if it's Garrett High School, but whatever high school it was in Garrett. Garrett is uh, near Auburn, just north of Fort Wayne. And in 1889, he came to Indiana University to play baseball, uh, which is by far and away my favorite sport. So this is sort of uh, a real connection for me. But anyhow, he came to play baseball here. And as you can see, he made quite a name for himself. Um, he was a baseball team member for all four years he was here. He ended up graduating. He got his Ph.D., at Penn State later on, he came to IU as first as an instructor, then an assistant professor, an associate professor, a professor of English. Um, you, you can read it all down there. And then in 1921, he became the dean of men. But the important thing on this list is he was the faculty representative to the athletics committee. He was devoted to athletics his entire life. Um, and he spent his years here. There's one little gap in there where he tried to go out and do something commercial for a couple of years, but mostly he spent his year. And then he was named the Dean of Men. Now they had a Dean of Men and a Dean of Women back then. Um, but he was noted for being very, very uh, helpful to any student who would come to his office. Uh, he lived his life here in Bloomington. He died, as you can see, in April of 1947, which was the year before I was born. Although it's interesting, my father was already here, but he didn't know any of this at that time in 1946. He's buried at Rose Hill Cemetery here in Bloomington. Mr. Simbauer is. I have been to his grave more than once now. And Simbauer Field, which was built in 1951, 
uh, was named and dedicated to him because of his constant love of baseball and all athletics at Indiana University. So the next time somebody asks me, oh, are you connected to that Simbauer field? My answer will be different than it always has been in the past. Yes, I am. This man was my, if you look at genealogy, he was my first cousin three times removed, which means three generations back. Um, and uh, he had a son, by the way, who also lived here his entire life and died in 2007, I believe but had no children. So there's no one left in this line for me to connect with. But it was just an interesting little personal thing for me that I discovered in doing the research for my great-great-grandfather's Civil War service. I don't think Mr. Simbauer was in the Civil War. Um, but anyway, that pretty much does it for me. Um, oh, one more thing about Mr. Simbauer. I should tell you this, that he... Uh, I almost forgot this, and this is one of the most important things. You can get an idea of how important this man was to the university and to the community. When he died in 1947, the person who organized his funeral and who spoke at his funeral was William Lowe Bryan, who had been the president of Indiana University until he resigned in 1937. Another person that spoke at his funeral was Herman B. Wells, and two of his pallbearers were Branch McCracken, you may remember Branch McCracken Florida Assembly Hall, and Zora G. Clevenger. Uh, there's an award named after Mr. Clevenger that's given to an athlete every year at Indiana University. So this is my relative who I had no idea I was related to, existed or anything until about three months ago. And he was a mover and shaker in this university. And I just, I'm just proud of that. As Jerry Prokopovich would say on his uh, show, Civil War Talk Radio, when people complain about how he palavers on at the beginning of the show every week, it's my show and I'll say what I want. So anyhow, that's all I have. Uh, I want to say one more thing before I turn it back over to Scott. And that is that this was all driven by um, my going for a personal story. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm hoping that any of you who have someone out there who can, and Scott, you may have said this while I was desperately trying to get my computer going again, but anybody out there who has a story of it, and I don't, it doesn't have to be long, but if you have a story of uh, a family member who was in the Civil War and you would like us to help you put it together and tell us all about it, boy, we'd love to hear it. This is good stuff. Thank you. Very good. Steve, you can go ahead and hit the um, leave and share. I'm, I'll go ahead and stop it here, too. There you go. You got it. Got it. OK. So any questions that anyone has? I, I had one, actually, as you were. And I don't know how much you delved into um, any of, of Graham Wilson, if he had any siblings. And if so, did they also join? Um, or, or any other relatives, cousins, anything else he, he, that, that you found that they also joined uh, any units, either north or south? He had, and I can't remember whether it's either seven or eight siblings. Um, I think five of them were girls, but I don't think either of the, of the other boys were ever involved in that at all. For one thing, they were... Um, you know, different ages, but no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I haven't found any connection to anybody else in his family um, in the civil war that were mm. soldiers. Interesting. And you had um, mentioned once before, or you, I should say, you talked here a little bit about, about his life after the war. Were you able to find an obituary for him or anything? I haven't um, yet. Newspaper, anything like that? Haven't yet. I've, I've, now I've looked, but I have not yet. Yeah, uh, in I, fact, it's interesting. My next door neighbor was the one that told me about um, him dying on the streets of Louisa, Kentucky, of a heart attack on New Year's Day in 1897. Um, I, she found that on the Internet, and I looked where she found it, and I haven't been able to take that and stretch it out to anything else either. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting, you know, what you can and cannot find and, and what, what remains out there. Um, we do have a question. Um, do you know what the name Grimes was in, in Wilson's name? That I knew was... somebody would ask me that, and I don't <laughs> have a clue. Um, I don't know whether it's because he was a dirty sort of fella or whether that was a family name or whatever, but no, I don't know what that means. 
Well, well, it's it's interesting. I found another at one time, and I I, can't, I wish I could remember where it was, but I came across a Confederate uh, officer who had the same nickname, Grimes. Oh, really? So I, I don't know. You're, you're right. That may have had some sort of meaning to them at that time. Yeah. Um, but but I don't know what where that gentleman got his nickname yeah. from either. And it was late in my research before I even found out that his first name was Thomas. Uh, he obviously went by his middle name, and I would guess his entire life, Graham Wilson. But his first name was Thomas. So I don't I don't know anything about that either. Well, and, you know. Uh, my father's name was Lindsay James Simbauer, Lindsay James Rolfe, however you want to look at it. Um, and uh, uh, he went by Jim or James his entire life. He, I don't know whether he didn't like Lindsay or whether they didn't want to call him that. I don't know. But he was he was Jim all of his life. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Sherry Wells asked and she asked when VMI was burned down, was anyone hurt? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, I'll tell you somebody who might be on there that could tell you more about that because uh, he went to BMI and that would be uh, our friend, Mr. McGuigan. Uh, but I don't believe anybody was hurt in that. And this wasn't too long after the new market raid either, or the new market uh, battle the, where the students were. But I don't think that anybody was hurt. Hmm. Interesting. Um, how did, did you, and again, thinking ahead here, to if anyone else has interest in doing a program on one of their relatives or ancestors. Um, what did you primarily use for your resources to kind of put together this program about one of your ancestors in the Civil War? Well, um, I tried to get resources, some resources from uh, the Louisa County, or the, excuse me, the Louisa, Kentucky, Lawrence County, Kentucky Historical Society. Um, I got a little bit of stuff from that, but not much. Uh, a lot of this just came off the internet. Um, I'm trying to think exactly what the sources were, uh, but they were just hits on the internet that I got, and it was just hit and miss here and there. Uh, I was not able to find any Confederate records. I think they must be out there, but I was not able to find any. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to have to plead a little ignorance. As, like I said, I'm not a genealogist. Um, and, and it's, and I'm never going to be because there's too many rabbit holes that you have to go down to <laughs> go down into, to be a genealogist. It's not my cup of tea. This was just interesting to me because of my, uh, my, uh, connection to this one man. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, you know, just adding to that, I will say there's a number of resources that are available, whether it be through the internet books, uh, county yeah. histories, um, courthouses, a lot of different things like that. And, and we, we, we have another suggestion for pro, uh, programs like Ancestry.com, Fold3. Uh, there, there, there's do, a I lot of those Ancestry. out there, but the problem, the problem is that Confederate records are so much harder to come by mm -hmm. than our Union records, just because a lot of things got burned in Richmond and, right. and were destroyed along the way as well. Right. Um, we do have another, uh, another question here. from. Can you tell us a little bit more about the CSA general who burned the town, Chambersburg, I'm assuming? Where the was Coslin? he from, and did he go to West Point or VMI or, or any of those? Do you know? Oh wow! Uh, you know, I I don't know. I'm I'm going to say a lot of I don't knows here because McCausland just came to me a few days ago, and I have not researched him. Um, but I know that he was very well admired by Jubal Early. Jubal Early stood behind him when McCausland, McCausland was actually the one that made the order to burn the town, of course, but Early stood behind him and said, I'm fine with that. That was, that was the thing to do. But no, I don't know. I don't know whether he was a West Point grad or not. Hmm. Very good. Any last questions? Oh, we just had another one pop up. Uh, John McGuigan did That's respond to the, the thing about uh, VMI and he says, um, no one was injured at Lexington from Hunter's Raid, though some uh, faulty wives and children were evicted. I don't know if that's uh, faculty wives or faulty. I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I'm assuming it's meant to be faculty wives and children were evicted from their institute homes, which were burned down, and buildings at Washington College next door were ransacked. Right. Yes, right. He, I, he does in fact confirm that was meant to be faculty wives, not just the faulty wives were <laughs> evacuated. It was in fact the faculty wives. Yeah, it's a little bit like faulty towers and yeah. BBC. Okay, and then we have another question here. Why would the state of Virginia include a CFA memorial for a regiment 
that came from West Virginia, or do I have my geography and understanding wrong? I'm not sure that I, I understand the question. Say it again. Well, he says, why would the state of Virginia include a memorial for a regiment that came from West Virginia, or do I have my geography and understanding well, wrong? Well, what, what they were doing was that West Virginia was Virginia at the time, at the beginning of the war. And they fought during the entire four years of the war as a Virginia unit. They were not a West Virginia. And it's interesting, there were also Virginia units that were federal. Uh, I didn't know this until there weren't very many of them, but there were two or three federal Virginia units. But, but the, um, the Eighth Cavalry stayed loyal to the state of Virginia, even when their home didn't become and that's an interesting thing too because i look back on this and i think okay when my when my great great grandfather came back he didn't go back to wayne county which would have then been west virginia where he was born and grew up was there a reason for that besides the fact that he married a woman from louisa kentucky or did he not want to go back to wayne county because it had left the state of virginia and he was still holding his uh, allegiance to the, the the original state of Virginia. I don't know. And that is interesting, too, because the re part of the reason that the state of West Virginia occurred was because that portion of Virginia was very strongly unionist yes. and dis disagreed with Virginia yes. having gone with the Confederacy. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know that, but I, I, I sort of have to assume that his going over the river, crossing the river, and spending the rest of his time in Louisa, Kentucky, probably might have had something to do with the fact that he was just not happy with the state of West Virginia being yeah. there. I don't know. Very good. Any last questions that we can uh, ask Steve prior to uh, um, ending our program for this evening? Okay, very well, seeing none. If you do have any other questions or anything occurs, um, it comes to mind later on that you may have a question about, please feel free to email Steve directly um, or you can email myself also and I can pass that along to him and perhaps we can put any of those answers to the question in the newsletter or Steve can respond to you directly as well. Be so thanks to. again, everyone for joining us uh, for tonight's program. Again, congratulations to our slate of roundtable officers moving forward from this point. Um, Steve Rolfe as president, Randy Stevenson as secretary, and John McGuigan as our treasurer. So we hope you'll join us again uh, in, in September when we begin our meetings, hopefully live again, but still with the Zoom component. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening.